My name is Erin Saub and I'm a faculty member at the University of Oxford in the Department of Earth Sciences and I'm also a tutorial fellow at St. Hughes College at the University of Oxford. I'm presenting on uh, paleoclimate data today in the environmental data session for this 2020 ecological niche modeling course. And I'm going to focus on the types of paleoclimate data available and how to obtain these data for use in ecological niche modeling. But first, let me tell you a bit about myself. Research in my lab is focused on the processes that cause speciation, extinction, and distributional changes over Earth history. I'm particularly interested in how species respond to environmental changes through time. And I'm also interested in the generative mechanisms for broad scale ecological patterns. For example, especially the latitudinal diversity gradient. How did it form? Why did it form? And how constant is it over Earth history? I'm also passionate about conservation and I'm involved in thinking about how the fossil record and paleontological data can contribute to modern day conservation efforts. You've already heard about past distributions from Dr. Corey Myers, and she talked to you about how to model past distributions and what needs to be considered when thinking about the past. There are essentially two ways to utilize paleoclimate or paleoenvironmental data in ecological niche modeling. The first is to use these data for projecting your model or hindcasting your model. And this is when you build your ecological niche model in the present day using present day environmental data and species occurrences. And then you project or apply or transfer. These are all similar words for the same phenomenon. Your present day model onto past climatic landscapes. And doing this allows you to get a sense for where it might have been suitable for your taxon under these past conditions. The other option uh, for using paleoclimate data in niche modeling is that you can build your niche model in the past using fossil distributional data for your taxon and then matching this fossil distributional data in the time period of interest to paleoenvironmental data characterizing that same time period. So in this second option, you're actually building your niche model in the past using the fossil record. There are many reasons you may want to utilize paleoclimate data in ecological niche modeling. You've already heard about some of these applications from Corey Myers and her presentation on past distributions. But essentially, hindcasting or building models in the past can tell you about, for example, the role of climate as a driver of extinction, the role of climate as a promoter of speciation, it can tell you about niche conservatism and niche evolution, so the relative rate and frequency of niche change within lineages and across speciation events. And it can also tell you about where groups were distributed in the past and how broadly they may have been distributed in the past. I thought I'd provide two examples from my own work of using paleoclimate data in ecological niche modeling to address some of these questions. And this first study I'll share with you is an example of performing ecological niche modeling in the fossil record itself. My co-authors and I in this study were interested in how niches change through time. There's currently a lot of debate about whether species can alter their environmental tolerances to changing environmental conditions. Uh, this question is particularly relevant because our climate is rapidly changing. And so it's important for understanding how species will respond to these changing conditions and then for implementing proper conservation measures. The question is also interesting from an evolutionary perspective in terms of knowing when uh, evolutionary change occurs. Do, do niches change at speciation events? or do they change uh, gradually within the lineage of a species? Unfortunately, modern uh, studies are limited in their ability to address this question 
because we really need a temporal perspective to get at niche change through time within a lineage of a species. And so this is where fossil data become extremely relevant and I can directly analyze niche evolution using uh, paleoclimate data and fossil data. I focused on 10 mollusk species in particular for this study. They're all alive today, but they have fossil records that extend into the Pliocene. So that's about 3.2 million years ago. And importantly, some of these species are of economic relevance. For example, Chrysostra virginica, the first species shown on this slide, is the Atlantic oyster and a multi-million dollar seafood crop. Using these 10 species, I tested for niche stability across 3 million years of environmental change, focusing on three intervals. The mid-Pliocene warm period at about 3.2 million years ago, the Emian last interglacial at about 130,000 years ago, and the present day. And I was able to focus on these three intervals because there was available climate model data for them that I could use for modeling, um, and there was also abundant spatial fossil data for these same intervals. So I could combine the paleoenvironmental data with my fossil occurrences to generate niche estimates for each of my species in each of these three time periods. I could then compare the niche model estimates that I generated in each time slice in multidimensional environmental space. And this is what I'm showing you here for uh, Anomia simplex. Uh, this is a bivalve species. So I'm showing you the first two principal component axes in environmental space, with the darker black indicating higher environmental suitability for this species. And what hopefully becomes obvious to you is that the black area is the same in both the Pleistocene and the present for this species. And this is what I found, was that there was remarkable similarity or stability in the niches of these species over the last three million years. The second study I will share with you uh, doesn't model the niches of species in the past, like I did in the previous study, but rather is an example of performing niche modeling in the present and projecting the present day model onto past climatic conditions. And in this study, my co-authors and I were interested in the extent to which climatic changes throughout the Cenozoic were responsible for driving observed biogeographic changes through time in 10 bird clades. These clades are ecologically distinct, but the thing that unites them is uh, their distributions. Today, they are limited to southern landmasses such as Africa, South America, Australia, New Zealand, and New Caledonia. However, they have early fossil representatives from very different regions of the world. Um, and this includes the western United States and northern Europe. And these fossils range in age from the Eocene, about 54 million years ago, to the Oligocene, about 28 million years ago. And I was interested in whether I could predict the fossil localities in the Eocene based on the present day tolerances for these clades. What I found was that the present day models of suitable habitat for these clades could correctly predict where the fossil occurrences were found. This is illustrated here for this example for mouse birds. All of the Euprisian fossil localities correspond with predicted suitable habitat, which is shown in pink, for the group during that time, in other words, 50 million years ago. And I'm not predicting the fossil localities uh, because I'm predicting the entire world as suitable for this clade. Uh, you can see here that only certain latitudinal bands were predicted as suitable. And this is pretty remarkable that I can take the present day tolerances of a bird clade and project these present day tolerances onto conditions uh, from 50 million years ago, and that the predicted suitable habitat corresponds with where we actually find fo the fossils for this group. Um, and this same pattern was found across all of the clades that I examined. I've shown you two ways to apply ecological niche modeling 
um, to the past using paleoclimate data. But of course, there's many other exciting and novel applications of paleoclimate data and niche modeling to the past. Um, but now that we have some sense of the types of analyses you can perform in the past, the question becomes, what type of paleoclimate variables should you consider for your study? And the short answer is that it will depend on your study questions. However, when you choose your environmental data layers, uh, direct variables are likely best. And direct variables are those that have physiological influence on habitat suitability for a given species. So for example, in the marine realm, direct variables include factors like temperature, salinity, oxygenation, pH, whereas indirect variables do not have an explicit physiological influence um, and only affect habitat suitability in that they correlate with one or more direct variables. So as an example, an indirect variable in the marine realm would include something like bathymetry or latitude. Um, unfortunately, it's often difficult to measure uh, any variable in the fossil record, uh, direct or indirect, and so we often must rely on proxies or simulated data from models. Your study question will also dictate which variables you may want to select, and often the most relevant and direct variables will sadly not be available for the past. And so in this case, you'll need to choose more indirect variables as a proxy for those direct variables. Some variables will also be more relevant depending on the scale of your study. So whether your study is regional or global in scale, and of course the ecology of your organism, whether for example, it is an ectotherm or an endotherm. There are two primary types of spatially explicit paleoclimate data for ecological niche modeling. The first of these data types are layers from generalized circulation models, which are otherwise known as climate models or GCMs. Dear Karger gave a nice introduction on climate models and data previously, uh, so I would encourage you to check out his presentation for more information on this. The other way to generate layers for ecological niche modeling is to derive your layers from the sedimentological and geochemical archives. Corey Myers discussed this in her presentation on past distributions, so again, I encourage you to check out her lecture. It's often necessary to derive your own layers in this way because GCM outputs are not necessarily available for all time periods um, in Earth history. I won't go into much detail on how to make your own layers from the sedimentological record, but if you are interested, I would encourage you to look at research by Alicia Stegall and Corey Myers, and this paper here, which is cited in the slide. Uh, the paper provides a nice overview of this method. Essentially, these layers, though, are constructed by assigning environmental characteristics to unique geographic points from field observations and literature survey. Um, and then generally, you have to uh, do some sort of interpolation method to make these uh, point uh, reconstructions some sort of continuous environmental layer that you can use in niche modeling. There are databases that you can rely on to make these layers um, that have sedimentological and geochemical information, including macrostrat and earth base. The other way of obtaining paleoclimate data for use in ecological niche modeling is from generalized circulation models, which I talked to you about previously. So GCMs are essentially incredibly complex mathematical models of the general circulation of our planet's atmosphere and ocean. And they take into account global conditions for the time period being modeled, which include the location and shape of terrestrial land masses, atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases, um, and orbital parameters. Modeling is performed in a gridded uh, system. And then the output from these models provide detailed estimates of the environmental and climatic conditions at every grid point, um, either in a regional model or in a global scale model. And examples of global simulations uh, are shown here. So for example, sea surface temperature uh, for the Ordovician, um, about 400 
and 45 million years ago and uh, for the Eocene at about 55 million years ago. These climate models are run by a variety of different institutions across the globe with efforts coordinated by the Paleoclimate Modeling Intercomparison Project, or PMIP. And the key aims of this project are to understand the mechanisms of climate change, uh, identify the different climatic factors that shape our environment, and also to evaluate and compare the models. PMIP was first established in the 1990s, and originally efforts were restricted to the last glacial maximum, uh, 21,000 years ago, and then the mid-Holocene, about 6,000 years ago. But now there are many other periods included in the efforts, uh, which I'll mention in a second. Uh, PMIP efforts are part of the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project, which is currently in its sixth phase. PMIP is currently focused on the mid-Holocene, again that's 6,000 years ago, the last glacial maximum, again, 21,000 years ago, the last interglacial, which is 127,000 years ago, and then the mid-Pliocene warm period, which is 3.2 million years ago. And access to some of these model outputs can be gained uh, through this data portal, which I've listed here, um, but it will require some searching and processing to get any of the variables in the typical format that we use for niche modeling. Um, at least for these recent runs. There have, however, been efforts to take the previous PMIP models and make them easily digestible and accessible for ecological niche modeling. And EcoClimate is one example. EcoClimate is a project to pre-process and make available the climate layers from PMIP3, which is part of the Climate Model Intercomparison Project Phase 5. So the previous version of PMIP. There are four time periods available from EcoClimate, the pre-industrial, mid-Holocene, last glacial maximum, and the Pliocene. And they're available for nine different generalized circulation models. And they're available at a resolution of 0.5 degrees, which has been downscaled from the native climate uh, model resolution. They are global in extent for surface precipitation and temperature variables, specifically the 19 bioclimatic variables. And these variables are things like annual mean temperature, maximum temperature of the warmest month, minimum temperature of the coldest month, uh, precipitation of the wettest month, etc. And importantly, um, even though these uh, coverages are global in scale and they do extend over the ocean, they're not necessarily suitable for modeling marine taxa because they won't necessarily reflect true conditions in the sea that are experienced by marine organisms. And so this is an, imp something important to keep in mind when you're considering this as a data source for your questions, especially if you're interested in the marine realm. Another subset of data derived from PMIP efforts is MARSPEC. We heard about MARSPECT already from Hannah Owens when she was discussing marine data. These layers are derived from the second phase of the Paleoclimate Modeling Intercomparison Project, and so are a bit older than the data used in ecoclimate. They can, however, be used for the oceans. So paleo MARSPEC layers are for the oceans only, um, and we can use them to model marine organisms. They are available for two time periods, the mid-Holocene and the last glacial maximum, and they're available for 12 different generalized circulation models. The layers have been downscaled to five arc minutes, about 10 kilometers, uh, and they are for all of the ocean basins and include things like bathymetry, sea surface temperature, and sea surface salinity. CHELSA is another data source for paleoclimatologies based on PMIP data, in this case the third phase of PMIP. Um, these data are based on an implementation of the CHELSA downscaling algorithm, which stands for climatologies at high resolution for the Earth's land surface areas. The great thing about these data is that they are very high resolution, so they're at 30 arc second resolution, which is about one kilometer. They are only though available for the last glacial maximum um, for seven generalized circulation models. 
And similar to uh, some of our other data sources we discussed, they are available for temperature and precipitation values at the Earth's surface. Um, and you can generate uh, the 19 bioclimatic variables from this data source. Um, and this is, a, as a result of, of the type of data that we have for CHELSA, they're not necessarily suitable for marine modeling. Paleoclim is another source of paleoclimate data derived from PMIP efforts. Um, this is an online database of paleoclimate variables that have been generated by paleoclimate modelers. Uh, and the data captures 10 different time periods across the Pleistocene and the Pliocene for two generalized circulation models, HADCM3 and CCSM. And these databases uh, provide the standard 19 bioclimatic variables across the globe for use in ecological niche modeling. Again, probably not suitable for marine modeling. This is just uh, a bit more detail on those 10 time periods that are available. Um, so it includes everything from the Heinrich Stadial at about 17,000 years ago to the last interglacial at 130,000 years ago. The previous examples provided paleoclimate data layers as ready-made objects um, that you can easily slot into niche modeling studies. But there are other ways to obtain paleoclimate data. Uh, for example, the National Center for Environmental Information offers a search and download function for paleoclimate proxy data and paleoclimate reconstructions from their paleoclimatology archives. Um, and their archives includes over 10,000 data sets, uh, everything, as I said, from reconstructions to paleoclimate proxies derived from natural sources like tree rings, ice cores, corals, and ocean and lake sediments. Um, and so to circle back to the other way to generate paleoclimate data, these sorts of proxy records could actually be used to generate your own layers um, using that first technique that we discussed, if you so desire. Other GCM models are available through specific groups. Um, and this is an example for the Hadley Climate Center Earth System model. Uh, as performed by the Bridge Group. The following are a subset of the papers produced by the Bridge Group, which have simulation data stored for them. And so you can access uh, this web page and it gives you um, three pieces of information. A summary page, which shows you sort of the basic results of the simulation. Uh, then there's an interactive page, which allows you to create your own plots of the data. Um, and then you can actually download the model simulation data itself um, using uh, your own tools. And then finally, DeepMIP is a new effort to model paleoclimate in deep time, which is being developed as part of the Paleoclimate Modeling Intercomparison Project. The DeepMIP effort is focused on three warm periods in the past, from the early Eocene and the latest Paleocene, including the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, which occurred about 55.5 million years ago. And these data should be uh, more readily available in the future, but are already being published on, so you can learn more about them um, at this web address. We've discussed where we can obtain paleoclimate data, uh, but these data cannot be applied uncritically in our ecological niche modeling analyses. We have to consider some general rules when using generalized circulation models in particular. And the first of these rules is that paleoclimate data from generalized circulation models are just models. And of course, models do not equal reality. So we need to consider the uncertainties in these models and how these uncertainties may affect our niche modeling results and analyses. And one way we can do this is by comparing the models to proxy data. So it's important to prioritize data from generalized circulation models that have published papers that have compared their models to proxy data. And we want to avoid models without this uh, proxy model comparison. Um, and this is because modelers frequently perform what-if simulations where they look at particular mechanisms within the model 
and they're actually not interested in whether the model is right or accurately simulating past climate. And so you obviously want to avoid using these types of models in your niche uh, modeling analyses and instead focus on the models that are actually trying to accurately estimate past climate conditions. As paleoclimate data users, we also need to be aware of systematic failures in the GCMs. So for example, until recently, no climate models could successfully simulate the humid phases over North Africa during periods in the Quaternary. Um, and it was therefore, of course, difficult to do any niche type modeling in this region. Similar issues apply to the extreme warm climate of the Cretaceous and the Eocene. Uh, again, until recently, models failed to correctly simulate the high latitude warmth, so temperatures poleward of about 50 degrees north and south latitude uh, should be treated with caution. On the whole, uh, we, al we also have more confidence with some climate variables than with other climate variables. So for instance, we think temperature is more reliable than precipitation in these models, and precipitation is more reliable than clouds and hence solar radiation. So we should be aware of this when developing ecological niche models. Basically, we have more confidence uh, with temperature-based bioclimatic variables than we do with precipitation-based ones. Following from this previous point, uh, one should try to use more than one GCM model, uh, as GCM models will of course vary in how they capture the climate and how well they estimate climate in certain regions. And so by using more than one climate model, you can compare the results of your analyses um, from these different GCMs. This is possible to do for the PMIP time periods, as we've been discussing, uh, but it's more difficult for the other time periods. And of course, running uh, an ecological niche model with several different climate model outputs will provide insight into the robustness of your conclusions. A climate model is also only as good as the boundary conditions it uses to characterize paleoclimate. Um, and these boundary conditions include things like greenhouse gas concentrations, um, like CO2 and methane, orbital configurations, and the configuration of continents and topography on those continents. And if these parameters are uncertain, then the climate outputs will also be uncertain. And in general, the older the period, the more uncertainty that exists. So we really need to be cautious of GCM data derived from deeper time periods um, and interpret the results accordingly and with the appropriate caution. Uh, and perhaps in deeper time, it's especially wise to use more than one different GCM and assess how results vary. As a general rule, uh, you should also try to choose a climate model that has the highest native or raw resolution. So the native resolution means that the model itself works on a high resolution rather than sort of being post-processed to a high resolution. And this is particularly important for terrestrial data because the higher the resolution, the better that mountains and other features are represented and therefore the better that climate is represented in those areas. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, uh, it's important to work closely with the modelers who actually produce the paleoclimate data. And it's only by discussing with the paleoclimate modelers that the full range of uncertainties and limitations of the model can really be appreciated. Um, I've listed here some climate modelers who I know and I've worked with, um, but of course there are many others. And it's really important, again, to acknowledge, work closely, and incorporate these data producers into your study. This just provides a general summary of what we have been discussing. You will need to consider the temporal and the spatial resolution required to address your study question. And you will need to consider whether that temporal and spatial resolution is provided by paleoclimate data as it currently stands. You'll also need to consider the type of variables needed to address your study question and whether, again, the quality and quantity of paleoclimate data meets your needs. Um, and if it doesn't, you need to tailor your question um, to uh, the availability of that paleoclimate data.
With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and to especially thank Paul Valdez and Dan Lunt from the University of Bristol, who provided a lot of the thoughts and considerations on using paleoclimate data that I presented here.